Now that we've looked at right triangle trig and we've looked at radians, degrees, coterminal angles, we've talked about finding sine and cosine, and we've recognized that a lot of these calculations require access to a calculator. Well, people a long time before us noticed that too, and they also noticed that the calculations for sine and cosine and tangent were very repetitive when when they were solving these problems. So they came up with a way uh, to organize the information into kind of like a chart so that you could easily access the answers to sine, cosine, tangent, secant, cosecant, cotangent, any of our trig functions without access to a calculator, so long as we're dealing with the more common angle measures. So when they first started doing this, they said, okay, we're gonna make a unit circle. And the reason it's called a unit circle is because the radius of that circle, so right here where my radius is, the radius is one. So that means if I put my circle on the x, y coordinate grid, the center of my circle is at the point zero, zero, because that's my origin. And the radius of my circle, since my radius is one, my coordinate here would be one, zero. Since my radius is one, if I rotate my radius, a little bit thicker radius so we can see it. If I take my radius and I rotate my radius around the circle up to the y-axis, I still have a radius of 1, which just means the coordinate here is 0, 1. If I continue to rotate, my next coordinate is going to be negative 1, 0, because I went back 1, but I'm on the x-axis. And if I rotate again, I'm down at 0, negative 1. And I can keep going and get back to my original point of 1, 0. I know that I can rotate around and around if I wanted to. I could keep rotating to get my coterminal angles. I could rotate clockwise and get my negative coterminal angles. But no matter which way I rotate or how many times I rotate around, my radius is always going to be 1. And my coordinates are going to stay the same because my radius is staying the same. So my four main coordinates of the unit circle are these coordinates that we just went in and labeled, the 1, 0, 0, 1, negative 1, 0, and 0, negative 1. And these coordinates are going to help us connect right triangle trigs, so our SOHCAHTOA, and our radians and degrees measure and our coterminal angles, so that we can make a chart that allows us to get the sine and the cosine or any trig function for any of these points on the unit circle. Because we also know from looking at coterminal angles that if I'm at the start of the circle, I have zero degrees or zero radians. We know up at the top, I'm talking about 90 degrees. Here I'm at 180. And 270. So what we're going to do as we rotate around, we're going to start kind of collecting all of this information together in order to be able to find or evaluate any of our six trig functions at our main angles. So first let's look at a breakdown of where the angle measures should be and how we kind of can remember them a little bit easier. So let's first look at degrees, and then we'll look at radians. So we already know, if we're looking at degrees, we know this is zero degrees. We know up top, 
is 90. We have 180. As we keep going, we get 270. And then back to the beginning, we have 360. So now, when we're making this unit circle, we're using our special right triangles. So those are triangles that have angles of 30, 60, and 45. So if I'm looking at this first measurement here, this angle, if I was going to take out my protractor and actually measure it, has an angle of 30 degrees. If I look at the next line, I can see that it splits my first quadrant directly in half. So this is an angle of 45 degrees. My last angle, which is up here in this first quadrant, is a measure of 60 degrees. So now as I continue around, every middle line so if I'm looking specifically just at, at the lines that split each quadrant right down the middle all of these angles count by 45 degrees so I have 45 degrees 45 plus 45 gives me 90 if I add another 45 I get 135 degrees. Add another 45, I get 180. Add another 45, I get 225 degrees. Another 45, I get 270. Another 45, I get 315 degrees. And then I'm back to 360. So all they did to get these angle measures is go around and count continuously adding 45 degrees. Now in order to get the other lines that are here, those are our angles that are counting by 30 degrees. So we're going to ignore our 45 degrees when we count these angles. And we're only going to count all of these lines that are broken down by 30 degrees. And every time we move forward, I'm just going to add another 30 degrees to get our degree measures. So first I have 30 degrees, 30 plus 30 gives me 60, 60 plus 30 gives me 90, 90 plus 30 gives me 120 degrees, 120 plus 30 gives me 150, and notice I bypassed the line for 135 degrees because those are my 45 degree angles. 30 and 45 are not multiples of each other, so I'm just ignoring those. I'm just using my multiples of 30. 150 plus 30 gives me 180. 180 plus 30 gives me 210. 210 plus 30 gives me 240. 40 plus 30 gives me 270. 270 plus 30 gives me 300. 300 plus 30 gives me 330. Now I'm back to the beginning, beginning with my 360. So anytime you're looking at the unit circle, you're going to see all of these angles on there. They're going to leave them on there for your reference because these are our common angles when we're talking about special right triangles. So the nice thing about the unit circle is it has degrees and it's going to have radian measures on it so that we no longer have to physically bust out our conversion and convert between radians and degrees. We can just go ahead and actually look at the unit circle, find where they are sharing a point, and then pick out which ones are the same. So we already know when we're talking about radians, we know that when we start, we have zero. We know halfway around the circle is pi, and all the way back around is 2 pi. We also know that 90 degrees is half of 180 degrees, so we know that up here we have half of pi, which is pi over 2. We also know if we go 1, 
to three quadrants around, we have three pi's out of two. So now let's look at how we can get those other angles without having to actually physically convert them all because it's a lot of work for us to convert it. We can also make mistakes trying to simplify. So let's look at a different way to get a better understanding of this. So we can see right off the bat that our unit circle is broken up by our x-axis and our y-axis. So now if I take each quadrant and I split it directly in half, I know that when I do that, that each quadrant is 90 degrees and our brains kind of like to think in degrees because we're used to that. Uh, but we still need to figure out what our radiant degrees are going to be. So if we know that pi over 2 is 90 degrees, we know that half of 90 degrees is 45, but we can also think about what's half of a half, and that's 1 fourth. So if we take a half and we split it in half, we're going to have four pieces, and we can see that because I have 1, 2, 3, four pieces where I used to have two pieces. So since I have four pieces now, I can say that this is pi over four. So now, since this is pi over four, my next angle is the same thing as saying two pi out of four, but two pi out of four simplifies to be pi over 2. So when we're writing our unit circle, we're just going to use the most simplified version of the fraction. So I don't really need that 2 pi over 4. But if I go around the circle to the next line, my next 45 degree angle, now I see that I have 1, 2, 3 pieces out of 4. So this measure, this radian measure, is 3 pi out of 4. And if I went one more, I'd have 1, 2, 3, 4 pi out of 4, and 4 pi out of 4. Oop. 4 pi out of 4 is the same thing as saying pi. So again, on our unit circle, we just see the most simplified version. Next, I would have 5 pi out of 4. And I'm just counting the pieces as I go around. Then I'm going to have 6 pi out of 4, which is the same thing if I reduce it to 3 pi out of 2. And then I have 7 pi out of 4 and 8 pi out of 4. So if you look at all of the, or all of the numerators, I have a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. All I did was count how many pieces out of four I had all the way around in order to get those radian measures. Now, I don't want to keep the unsimplified version, so the first thing I'm going to go back and do is I'm going to erase the unsimplified versions because I want the most simplified versions on my circle. So I'm going to get rid of the 6 pi out of 4. I'm also going to get rid of the 4 pi out of 4 and the 8 pi out of 4. So now on my unit circle, when I look, I'm just going to have my pi out of 4 measures, or a denominator of 4, on those 45 degree angles. So let's get our radian measures for the other pieces of the circle. So I'm going to go in and erase all of this. Let's do these in orange, just so we can see them a little bit differently. I'm still using my x-axis. I'm still using my y-axis, but this time I'm using my 30 degree angles, and we know that our 30 degree angles are these ones. Here, here. We're omitting that middle line because that middle line is 45 degrees. It's not a multiple of 30, so we don't want it when we're counting our 30 degree angles. 
and I'm literally just going to go around and count these. So now I can notice if I look at the top half of my circle, I have one, two, three, four, five, six pieces out of pi. Now the reason I'm only counting the top half is because I only want to know what I have in one full pi. I want to know how many times I broke up one full pi when I'm writing my denominators and when I'm writing my fractions. I don't want to know all the way around the circle because that's two full pies. I want to use just the one full pi. So I see that I have six pieces, which just means that my first piece is one piece of pi out of six. My next piece is two pi out of six. Then I have three pi out of six, four pi out of six, five pi out of six, six pi out of six, seven pi out of six, eight pi out of six. Do you see the pattern? Just counting, nine pi out of six, 10 pi out of six, 11 pi out of six, and now I'm back to two pi, which would be 12 pi out of six, but I know I don't really need that because 12 pi out of six is gonna simplify to two pi. So the other thing I see right away is that not all of my fractions are in most simple form when I count by sixes, right? I have a two pi out of six, four out pi out of six, eight pi out of six, and 10 pi out of six. They all have common factors of two. They can all be simplified. So let's go in and simplify those fractions. And we'll notice when we simplify two pi out of six, divide both of them by two, we get pi over three. When I simplify four pi out of six, divide them by two, I get two pi out of three. Eight pi over six becomes four pi over three and 10 pi over six becomes five pi over three. So I'm gonna go in now and delete the things that I don't really need. I know that pi over two is more simplified than three pi over six, so I'm gonna get rid of that just because it's cluttering up my circle. Pi is more simplified than six pi over six. Three pi over two is better than nine pi over six. And then I also see that I went in and I simplified these fractions. So I'm gonna get rid of the two pi over six. I'm just gonna move this in. Get rid of the four pi over six. Move in my more simplified fraction just to make it easier to read for myself. I'm gonna to wanna to get rid of eight pi over six because that's not simplified. Move in four pi over three. So when you first look at the unit circle, it's going to look really overwhelming because there's a whole bunch of information on there. There's all the degrees, there's all the radian measures, but it's really not that bad because we just saw in order to get the degrees, they just added the angles together every single time as they rotated around. In order to get the radians, even though they're fractions and we don't really love fractions, all they did was count the pieces they had, which you can absolutely do. So let's take this one step farther. Now that we know where the radians and the degrees are, we're gonna take those and they're gonna end up overlapping on the unit circle. But the cool thing about this is, is if I have asked you to convert 30 degrees to radians, the old you had to bust out the conversion of pi over 180 and actually do the calculation in order to get it. The new you knows that 30 degrees is right here, which is that first line on the unit circle. So if I look at my radian version, the first line on the unit circle is pi over six. So 30 degrees is equal to pi over six radians, so you're playing I spy in order to get the conversions in order instead of actually doing the calculation. So that's kind of cool that we can, don't have to do those calculations anymore. We can just look up the answer or the conversion right on the unit circle. So now let's take what we know about those angle measures and let's add in some right triangle trig. 
save notes. Go ahead and we know that we have 0, 90, 180, 270, and 360. We also know that this is 45 degrees. So just to keep this explanation a little bit simpler, I'm not going to go in and add all the other angle measures just because it's going to clutter it a little bit and I want you to be able to see this next step. So when we talk about right triangle trig, we know right triangles are shapes like this, where if they're asking me to measure an angle, I have my opposite side, I have my adjacent side, I have my hypotenuse. I also know because of so ka toa that sine of the angle is the opposite over the hypotenuse. Cosine of the angle is my adjacent side over my hypotenuse. Tangent of the angle is my opposite over my adjacent. So say for example, I knew that this angle was 45 degrees. So say I had a triangle with an angle of 45 degrees. So right here, I can see that if I use my line for 45 degrees, I drop another line perpendicular so that I get this right angle with my x-axis. Now I have a right triangle with an angle measure of 45 degrees. I also know that because this is my unit circle, the radius of my circle, remember, so radius from the center to the side, we know is 1. So now if I take this, ang this radius and I rotate it, it doesn't matter where my radius is, could be here, could be here, could be here. My radius is always the same all the way around the circle. So look at this. My hypotenuse also happens to be my radius. So my hypotenuse is going to be 1. So I can go in and I can say, okay, my hypotenuse is going to be 1. However far I went over, so my this would be my adjacent side. It's also going to be, if I'm talking about my unit circle, it's going to be my x value because I'm talking about how many I'm moving over. And here, ooh, that didn't work out any better, but here I'm talking about my opposite side which is also my vertical distance that I'm traveling. So this is my y value when I'm talking about a coordinate. And I can actually calculate those numbers. I can calculate those sides, right, if I wanted to, using sine and cosine, because I know my hypotenuse. So if I wanted to, let's see. Clean this up a little bit so we have space. If I wanted to find this missing side, if I want to find this distance, we already said we know that this is the opposite, or ooh, hello, this is the adjacent side because it's touching the angle. Adjacent side. So since it's the adjacent side, if I wanted to calculate that side. I know the adjacent side is what I want to find and I have the hypotenuse so adjacent and hypotenuse gives me cosine so I could say cosine of 45 degrees equals the adjacent side over the hypotenuse which is 1. We also said 
the adjacent side is the x value. So I could even go one step further and I could replace where I have the adjacent side with an x. So I can say, okay, cosine of 45 degrees is x. And now I know I can go into Desmos and I can put in cosine of 45 degrees and I can get out a value for x. And when I do that, I'm going to get a really long decimal. If I write that decimal in the most accurate form, it's actually going to be root 2 over 2. So now I know that this side here, the base of my triangle, has a length of root 2 over 2. I could do the same thing to get this side. The only difference is now I'm working with my opposite side, so I'm going to use sine, and this would be the sine of 45 degrees equals, since I'm doing the opposite side and it's up and down, I'm going to say y over 1, so sine 45 degrees equals y, which is just also going to be y equals root 2 over 2. So this side is also root 2 over 2. And that makes sense to me because I know 45 degree triangles are isosceles triangles. Their legs are going to be the same size, so those numbers should be the same. So what happened was we started noticing that these triangles were very common, and that's why we picked these angles for our unit circle. These are our special right triangles, and um, because they show up so often, we wanted to make sure that we had like a reference table for them. So we took these measurements and we said, oh, well, when I traveled from the origin over, that's my x, right? And when I travel up, that's my y. So I could say that my coordinate at 45 degrees, if I'm looking at this point on my unit circle, this point has an x value of root 2 over 2 and a y value of root 2 over 2. So they went through and they calculated each triangle for each point and they wrote down the x value and the y value for these coordinates. And they also realized that when we were talking about the x value, the x value was always our cosine. And the y value was always our sine. So now when we're reading this unit circle, it has all these coordinates all the way around it. So I can use the unit circle in order to find the cosine of 45 degrees without actually using my calculator because now I know 45 degrees is right here. So then I look for the coordinate and I know cosine is my x value. So I pick out the x value right from the table. So now we kind of have an idea of where the numbers on the unit circle came from. Let's look at the actual unit circle and use it in order to answer questions with trig in order to evaluate trig functions. So when we take it and we put it all together, everything that we just talked about, we end up with the unit circle, which looks like this. And it's a little bit overwhelming because there's a lot of information. But we already know that first we have all of our degrees, then we have all of our radian measures, and on the very outside, we have all of our coordinates. So when we're reading our unit circle, if we want to find the cosine of any angle, the cosine is always going to be your x coordinate. So for example, if I wanted to find the cosine of, let's go 30 degrees, I'm going to look, let's move this over here. I'm going to look at 
my unit circle. I'm going to find 30 degrees, which I see is here. Then I know cosine is my x coordinate, and I would definitely make sure I have this written down so that I can reference it. My x coordinate is my cosine, so then I just find the point that's coordinated with 30 degrees. So I get that my cosine is root 3 over 2, and I'm done. So I was able to find the cosine of 30 degrees just by looking at the unit circle. I didn't have to go to Desmos. I didn't have to set Desmos to degrees. I didn't have to type it in. I could just look at the unit circle and pick out the actual answer so I can continue solving the problem. So now we also know now that sine of any angle is your y coordinate. So if, for example, we wanted to find the sine of 7 pi over 6. All we're going to do is find 7 pi over 6 on the unit circle. So the best way to do this, especially because you're just getting used to finding these values, is to start at 0 and just kind of travel around. Nope, 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 till you find 7 pi over 6. Woohoo, I found it. There it is, 7 pi over 6. So 7 pi over 6 is right here. My sine is my y coordinate. So I look at my coordinate, I see that my y value is negative 1 half. So my answer, negative 1 half. Bam, done. Not so bad. But what about our other trig functions? Because now we've used the x coordinate, we've used the y coordinate. What about tangent? Well, we saw that tangent is our opposite over our adjacent side. So if I go back up and I look at my triangle that I drew, my opposite side is here. My adjacent side is here. So I can say that tangent is my y value, because remember, this is my y value, over my x value. So I can still find tangent tangent of any angle is just going to be my y coordinate divided by my x coordinate. So this is going to be a little bit more work because we're going to have to simplify our fractions, but we're really good at that, so we're not intimidated. So if we wanted to find, for example, the tangent of 2 pi over 3. We know it's going to be our x, or it's going to be our y value over our x value. So first, we're going to go around. We're going to look for 2 pi over 3. So do, do, 2 pi over 3. Ooh, there it is. Okay, so there's 2 pi over 3. And now I need my y value over my x value. So my y value is right here. It's root 3 over 2. My x value right here, negative 1 half. So now, technically I have my answer, but in the math world, if you give me two fractions inside a fraction, that is just one of the scary things I could ever possibly come across, and it just immediately makes me want to simplify. I've got to simplify that. That is just way too much fraction and fraction action. We've got to make that more simplified. So remember, if I'm dividing two fractions, I'm going to keep the top one exactly the same. I'm going to change this division sign to multiplication, and I'm going to flip the bottom one so that I get 2 over negative 1. And then I'm just going to multiply straight across. So I'm going to get 2 root 3 over negative 2. I can cross cancel my 2's, so I really just have negative root 3. So my tangent of 2 pi over 3 is just going to be negative root 3. So if I'm looking for my cosine, I'm going in and just picking out my x coordinate. 
looking at the circle, it's literally I spy. Pick out my X coordinate. If I'm looking for sine, I'm going in and picking out my Y coordinate. If I'm looking for tangent, I'm picking out my Y and my X coordinate. I have to divide them, but when I divide those fractions, I need to simplify them. So now you might also be saying, hey, but not all of these coordinates are fractions. Like what if I had tangent of 270 degrees? I see how they go around my circle. 270 degrees is right here. So my y value at that point is just negative 1 over my x value is 0. So now I have a fraction that's negative 1 over 0. Anytime I have 0 in my denominator, it's always going to be undefined. If 0 was in my numerator, it would just be 0. 0 in my denominator gives me undefined. So you may not have to keep change flip all of them because not all of them are fractions, but you are always going to simplify these tangent values as much as possible when giving your answer. So we know, most importantly, if you haven't written down anything anywhere, at least write down that your cosine is your x value, your sine is your y value, and your tangent is your y over x. Those we need to know. But we also know that we have trig functions other than sine, cosine, and tangent. We have cosecant, we have cotangent, we have secant. So let's look at, let's take a copy of our unit circle so we can keep looking at it. You sit over here and say, okay, well, we didn't want all this other stuff. We know now that cosine of the angle is our x coordinate, sine of the angle is our y coordinate, and tangent of the angle is y over x. The nice thing, it's easy to remember that cosine is the x and sine is the y because x comes before y in the alphabet and c whoop, c comes before s in the alphabet so they're in alphabetical order just an easier way to help you remember it but we also know that if we're talking about secant of an angle secant is the reciprocal of cosine so secant is one over cosine, that's what reciprocal means, and we know that cosine is the x value, so your secant is just 1 over the x, or the reciprocal of the x value. So for example, if we wanted to find the secant of pi over 6, we want to find pi over 6, which is right here. We want to find the x value, and we want to find the reciprocal of the x value. So I see that the x value is root 3 over 2, which means that my reciprocal, the reciprocal or the flip, right, is 2 over root 3. So I take that x value and I just flip it over. Now we also have our Algebra 2 spidey senses tingling a little bit because we have a square root in the denominator and that's not cool. So I know that I can't just leave that as 2 over root 3 because that's making my Algebra 2 teacher really, really sad. So I'm going to take 2 over root 3. 2 over root 3. And I'm going to rationalize that. I'm going to multiply both the top and the bottom by root 3 so that I can get that square root out of the denominator because we don't want to make anybody sad. So when I rationalize it, I get 2 root 3 over 
square root of 3 times square root of 3 cancels out the square roots because it really gives us square root of 9, which is just 3. So my secant of pi over 6 is 2 root 3 over 3. And I got that by taking my x value, flipping it over, and then rationalizing it. So now my secant, my secant is 1 over x. I'm going to find my cosecant next. So let's say, okay, we know cosecant is the reciprocal of sine, right? It's 1 over sine. So cosecant is going to be 1 over y. So if I, for example, wanted to find the cosecant of pi over 2, Oops. I should have written it as cosecant of pi over 2. I'm going to find pi over 2. Let's erase what I just did. Let's go and find pi over 2. Here it is. Cosecant is the reciprocal of my y value. When I flip 1, I still get 1. So this is just really 1 over 1, which is 1. So I'm not going to have to rationalize all of them. Some of them I'll just be able to flip and simplify. So cosecant, when I flip the y value, I get 1. So then I'm done there. So my cosecant is my reciprocal of my y value. So our last one we have to talk about is cotangent. And we know cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent, which means I really have 1 over y over x. Personally, I don't like fractions in fractions, so I'm going to keep the 1 and flip the denominator. So I get 1 times x over y, which is just x over y. So cotangent is x over y. So if I wanted to find the cotangent, pi over 4, I'm going to take my unit circle, I'm going to find pi over 4 right here. Then I'm going to take my x value and divide it by my y value. What I see right away so my x value and my y value of pi over 4 are the same, right? I get root 2 over 2 over root 2 over 2, which is a nice pretty fraction to simplify because the top and the bottom are exactly the same. So that also simplifies to 1. Ooh, my great circle. So in order for me to find my secant, my cosecant, my cotangent, I'm just finding the reciprocal of each of my cosine, sine, or tangent, and then I'm simplifying them if I have to use my Algebra 2 skills. So that's what you guys are going to do today. You're going to use the unit circle in order to evaluate specific trig functions that are on there.